All right, everybody, welcome to the Law and Self-Defense show on Gun Trust, the first show we've ever done with a guest on the show. Let's see if this is actually going to go live on Facebook and for our Law and Self-Defense members. It should be. There we go. All right, and I see it popping up. All right, awesome. So we are live on the air. Uh, with me is attorney Derek DeBras. Say hello, Derek. Uh, hello. Can you hear me, Derek? Yeah, can you hear me? Oh. Sorry. M mess up a mind. Go ahead, Derek. Say something again. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, now I can hear you fine. I'm sure everyone else could, too. <laughs> it was just on uh, on my end. Uh, so, folks, the reason I asked uh, Derek on, and Derek's an attorney I've known for you know, quite a few years now. Uh, we've done some work together on self-defense consult type um, cases before with very positive outcomes, I'm pleased to say. Um, but I, as I often caution people, I am a use of force attorney. That's my area of expertise. I'm not a gun law attorney. I know very little about gun law. I know about as much about gun law as I need as a private citizen who owns guns and wants to stay in compliance with the law. But I certainly don't claim any particular expertise there. And then uh, a week or so ago, we got a letter, an actual physical letter, believe it or not, uh, from a law self-defense member asking about gun trusts. I don't know anything about gun trusts, but I know a guy who does, and that is attorney Derek DeBras. So I asked him to come on the show as our first ever guest to uh, talk about gun trusts and explain to us what they are, how they work, why you might want one, what you should expect them to cost, the benefits, and so forth. So with that, Derek, can I ask you to introduce yourself to the law self-defense community? Yeah. Hi, everybody. It's Derek DeBra. Some of you may know me from my YouTube channel at Munitions Group. Uh, we're based out of Columbus, Ohio and Louisville, Kentucky. We also have a satellite office in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, and we have contact affiliate attorneys around the country. And uh, I know you work in a diverse array of uh, legal fields, not just uh, criminal defense law, but also other stuff, gun industry law. You want to speak to yeah. that? Anything regarding firearms or the firearms community, we pretty much handle. We we represent large manufacturers, importers, exporters, all the way down to mom and pop gun stores. Do a lot of regulatory compliance, restoration of rights, FAET taxation, import export law. Again, anything that touches an explosive or firearm, we're we're able to handle it. All right, cool. Uh, so for today, um, of course, we're here to talk about gun trust um, and. Um, First, Derek, perhaps you could explain to everybody what a trust actually is from a legal perspective, because they probably, many people won't even know that. Well, your, your audience is about to get an education. When I was in law school, uh, I teach probate in the states at the law school, as well as actually Second Amendment law at Capital University here in Columbus. And I always tell my students when I was in law school in the states, um, they never actually taught me what a trust was. So I'm about to educate your audience a little bit. Uh, in essence, when you get down to the common law, the core of what a trust really is, is simply a, a split in title or a separation of title to a piece of property, right? So take your car. Um, if you put it into a valid trust, the legal title holder, uh, who the car would be titled to would actually be the trustees, right? They hold what we call legal title. And then there's equitable title that's split off from the legal title. The equitable title is generally held by the beneficiaries. Um, one of the things you see in gun trusts, and we can talk more about is when you, you have a lot of clients do these at home trusts and they don't understand the law. Sometimes they'll put themselves in as the only trustee and the only beneficiary. And that split doesn't actually exist. So the trust doesn't technically exist under the law. Um, so it is very important that we understand what a trust really is. So a very quick definition is a separation of legal from equitable title with the imposition of fiduciary obligations upon a trustee. Okay, so would it be fair to say a trust is like a, almost like a, a legal entity, like a legal person that can own property? It's, you know, I would say it's more of a, a mix between that and a contract. It, it's a relationship from the grantor or settler, the person who creates the trust, with the trustee, you know, to carry out their wishes, not necessarily just because of their death, but it could be their incompetency. Um, it could just be because they want to protect their assets, tax mitigation, gun trust planning, there's a variety of reasons for it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't like saying it's an entity necessarily because it's not like you register it necessarily with the state of Ohio, right? And, it, and if it's not an irrevocable trust, there's pass through taxation. So your social security numbers where you report the taxes. So I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily an entity, but I would say it's probably a good way to think about it. It is separate though 
from us as people, right? It is, it can sue, it can be sued, can be involved in litigation, it can own property. So from that standpoint, Andrew, I would say, I think your thinking is correct. Okay. And these could be set up in any state. They're set up at the state level, the ones we're discussing, right? Not at the federal level? Yeah, the federal government, by and large, doesn't regulate uh, trust uh, trust at all. Uh, trust law comes, comes to us from England, from common law. Um, there's a lot of really interesting things that trust used to have to abide by and be valid under that law. Um, if anybody out there ever sees their grandparents' trust and there's like a dollar bill paper clip to it, it's because at common law, trust wasn't valid unless it held property. So for years, attorneys would just paper clip a dollar bill to the trust, and then it was a valid trust. Uh, in most states, including Ohio, that's been dealt with statutorily. So it doesn't actually, what Ohio's law actually says, it says that a trust is valid as long, regardless of the size of the corpus, and that means it could be zero, right? So it doesn't actually have to own property to be valid. Um, so the history of it comes from England, but every state has their own trust code. Most states follow the Uniform Trust Code or at least some semblance of it, just as Ohio does. So it is a state level thing. Um, I'm not licensed in every state. I do believe there might be one or two states out there, Andrew, where a trust might be forbidden from holding firearms. I don't know that for a fact. Maybe Massachusetts, I can't recall. I had heard something about that years and years ago, but never had the um, uh, financial incentive to look into it. Sure. Okay. So, uh, of course, trust can exist for all different kinds of reasons, but here we're talking specifically about gun trust. So trust in which uh, the trust could have ownership or, or possession or some kind of property interest in firearms or firearms related items like suppressors or uh, I guess full auto firearms or things along those lines. So what, what might be the reason we'd want to bother setting up a trust for various types of firearms in the first place? So just a point of clarification, <clears throat> um, at least in our office, when we say gun trust, we don't necessarily mean just NFA trust. We offer other types of trust for personal collections. You know, um, I have several clients that have a million dollars in guns and not necessarily are they NFA, but we need to plan for that from an estate planning standpoint. So the, the novel thing about my background is it's heavily, uh, I have a heavy background in estate planning and gun law. So it's, it's a really interesting area of law and how they overlap. Um, Trust, as you said, can be used for a variety of things. I, you know, if I represented Jay Leno, I could put all his cars into a trust, you know, things like that. I had a client that had a historical collection of books. We put it into a trust. Same thing with firearms. So the first thing people need to understand that is that the NFA trusts um, were, were, they came about in the marketplace primarily because under prior to 20, 2016, if you wanted to own an NFA item, you had to get what we call CLIO certification, chief law enforcement officer, right? So you had to get your sheriff to sign off. Historically, that makes a lot of sense because in 1934, when the National Firearms Act passed, which is the law that regulates these types of firearms, um, there was no background check system. There was no internet. We weren't as, uh, our culture wasn't as much of a uh, transitory culture, right? We tended to stay more in one place. So the sheriff wouldn't generally know the bad apples. Fast forward in the 20, into the 2000s and, and, and on from there, this became more of a political bat that sheriffs would use. So if they were generally Democrats, you know, they don't get elected on pro-gun platforms. They're not allowing their citizens to own these things. No reason for it other than politics. So in 2016, Obama changed that. And yes, it was President Obama who changed that. It became uh, certification. It became notification. So now we just have to notify the sheriff. We don't have to get his permission or her permission. Um, the reason for that is they, the Obama administration wanted something in return. And what they got in return was that all trustees on a trust must be background checked and photographed and fingerprinted. Um, before that, trust didn't get photographed, didn't have background checks run on them. You just submit the application and the gun would, the transfer would be approved and then you could possess the gun as the trustee. Does that answer your question? I might have got a little sidetracked there. So why did they, what are the implications of that change? What was happening before yeah, it was the Sandy Hook shooting, if I remember correctly, Andrew. Um, uh, after that shooting, if you remember, they tried to pass some gun control. They didn't get anywhere. I don't know exactly how it got to the president's desk. I had heard rumors that he or Biden had gotten a report, a financial report, and noticed that the NFA division was taking in all this money, which was for the taxes, and uh, asked about it. And that, that's when he was informed about gun trust, not knowing about it before. And so they came up with this this idea that they'll sell it to the American public that all these trustees need to get background checks because people will go out and actually form a gun trust to buy a gun illegally. I don't know that it's ever occurred. 
I don't know why a criminal would try to form a legal entity to get to avoid a background check. Um, but nevertheless, that's what was going on in our culture at the time. So there was this executive order. It was called 41. I believe at the time before it was finalized, it was called 41P. And then when it, once it was final, finalized, it was called 41F, which changed a lot of those regulations. Okay. So say you have a typical gun owner who owns maybe half a dozen guns, a shotgun, rifle, two or three pistols. Um, is Would it make any financial sense for that person to set up a trust? So you got to look at the purposes of a trust. Most people getting back to the history of the gun trust movement, uh, we're getting gun trust to avoid that sheriff requirement. But there's a much greater benefit to that trust. And that's the estate planning feature. When someone dies and they have a machine gun in their individual name and I get involved and they don't have a will or if they have a will, I got to put it through probate. So now I'm dealing not only with the ATF, right, on the transfer to the beneficiaries, I'm also dealing with probate. So I'm now, now, now we're talking specifically about an NFA item. Yes. Right. What, what about people who, you know, most people don't have NFA. Okay. Uh, guns, so on no. regular NFA items, normally what we tell clients is it's just simply elite, depending on the state, like Ohio, the biggest consideration is estate planning, right? So, you know, if you only have two or three guns and they're just Glocks and, you know, worth about $500 each, I tell you, it's not going to justify the cost to do a trust. It's just miscellaneous personal property. Um, now there is some benefits to our trust that we've added in. We've added in some red flag provisions and things like that. Uh, what if the beneficiary is disabled from owning guns? What happens to the gun? So there are these things that are in the trust that would help. But again, you have to weigh the cost versus the benefit. If you only have two or three guns, generally, I would tell you it's probably not worth spending a thousand to three thousand dollars on the trust, depending on the attorney you hire. So that's an interesting point. So say your typical gun owner, you got four or five Glocks, and that's it. Uh, normal guns, nothing exceptional. But uh, you suddenly, you find yourself subject to a, a red flag order from a court. Uh, mm -hmm. Normally, they'll want you to turn all your guns in, presumably to the, the, the court or the sheriff or whoever. Uh, if those guns are in a trust, could it simply be they instead be given to another beneficiary of the trust? So that's an interesting question. So that's that was my idea. And just for the viewer's sake, uh, you know, I'm in Ohio. I do Ohio law and Ohio does not have a red flag order, although our governor desperately wants one. Governor DeWine would mean we've been able to fend that off on due process grounds. But I have drafted this language into the trust exactly along the lines of what you've asked, Andrew. The theory in my mind as an attorney would be if I am subject to a red flag order or ERPO, emergency risk protection order, um, they're going to come, they're going to take my guns, and then I'll have a full hearing 15 days after that time. Um, well, that makes sense if they're my guns, but what if they're not my guns, right? So the trust, again, going back to what a trust is, it's very important to understand what it is. Who legally owns those guns? It's the trustee. So we draft language in the trust that says the minute you're subject to an ERPO, you're kicked off the trust, at least for the pendency of that action. Your successor trustee then moves up. Now they are the legal owner of the gun. If they are their guns, the sheriff should have no authority under that law to possess those guns. You follow? Yeah. Yep. And it probably comes down to the statutory interpretation of that law. And every state's a little bit different, but I don't see how they could get around that. Now it might be a mootness issue because by the time you bring an action, that full hearing has happened and maybe those guns are returned. But if they're not returned, I would damn well think that we could file an action against the sheriff um, for taking those firearms, government taking, right? It's the right. trust property and, and that person's no longer on the trust. So that might be able to, you know, keep the, um, the sheriff from seizing the guns, taking possession of the guns, but presumably the person subject to the ERPO would still not be privileged to possess the guns That's themselves, correct. right? Okay. That's correct. I don't think there's a way given the way those red flag orders are drafted to get around that. I sure. don't think how it would be possible. Uh, yeah. And folks, we're not trying to figure out a way to get around court orders. I'm just wondering what the boundaries of those things are. Right. So, um, all right. So um, that's with respect to regular guns. So there could be rationales for doing it, uh, gun trust, even in that context. But I, I most often see the gun trust question come up when we're talking about NFA type items. Right. Um, because there's, there's uh, I guess, a lot of complications there of, uh, you know, if I own a, half a dozen machine guns and half a dozen suppressors and other NFA type stuff. And I get hit by a bus and my wife is left with a box of all that stuff. Right. What the hell is she supposed to do with that? Because presumably she's not privileged to possess that stuff. She, she's not until she becomes your estate fiduciary. And that was one of the changes by Obama before that 2016 executive action. It was unclear, right? Now the way the ATF enforced it, they would say they would give the family or fiduciary a reasonable amount of time to dispose of the property, but it was never, codified it was never in the regs and so they changed that in 2016 but again there's this gap you die 
Andrew, you have a machine gun until she's appointed. She's not technically the fiduciary. So there's this gap of time before she can technically own or possess rather that gun. Um, the trust handles a lot of those issues because there's a seamless transition of trustees that would be present within the trust itself. Okay, so explain how that works. So you, we, uh, an attorney would write up the trust for you. How does the machine gun become inside the trust? How does that work? Right. So I think a little history in the NFA is is pertinent. If you don't mind me giving a little bit, no, no, of please. All class spiel here. So 1934 is the very first gun control law in this country. That's the National Firearms Act. It was a, it's, it is a tax law. It's found under the Internal Revenue Code. Um, if anybody knows anything about mob history, all this gets to kind of tied in together. Um, the the North, North Side Italian Gang, and I think it was the South, the South Side Italian Gang or North Side Bugs Moran Gang, and then you had the, or that was the Irish Gang. Sorry, I'm getting my my gangs mixed up. And then you had the Alphonse Capone Italian Gang. So you had the Irish and the Italians. Saint Valentine's Day Massacre happens February fourteenth, I think nineteen twenty nine, if my my memory serves me correctly, um, and that's where Bugs Moran's gang was gunned down by uh, people dressed as police officers in Chicago who were members of the Al, Al Capone gang, and they used street sweepers is what they called them. They were Tommy guns, right? Fully automatic machine guns. Back then, you could buy a Tommy gun out of, a, I think Popular Science might have sold them. You could they ship them to your door. Uh, and the cost of those machine guns was generally $200. With inflation, that's roughly about, well, <laughs> with inflation prior to the last six months, it was about $4,500, maybe about five grand a day. Um, so think about who could actually afford these guns back then. Just think about the type of people, right? It was largely probably going to be successful, rich white men that could afford that kind of money. Because when the NFA was passed in 34, not only did you have to pay for the price of the gun, now you had to pay a tax, right? And it doubled the value of that Tommy gun. So that's why it's $200. It was based on the price of that Tommy gun. They've never adjusted that for inflation. So as we fast forward into 1986, you have the Gunners Protection Act. They limited the supply of machine guns. No more new machine guns allowed on the registry. So you have limited supply. You have the, the, the dollar devaluing. More people can afford $200. So you have increased demand. So the price of machine gun just goes through the roof. When I first started in this industry, I think you could get a Mac for around three grand. They're going for upwards of 10 grand now, maybe more in certain instances. They're just very, very good investments in that regard. But it's a weird little it's a weird little economy that the federal government's carved out by regulation, right? I think an economist could do a great white paper on it. Um, but nevertheless, it's kind of the history of the NFA. But the NFA, when you look at the regs, says that a person shall register these guns. So what is a person? Well, it's not defined in the NFA, but it's defined generally in the USC. Uh, and it includes not only a natural person, but it also includes an entity or trust. And the so, USC is, for our audience. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, the United States Code, our federal laws. So in the definition section, if you if you look at that, so a trust can own these guns and an entity like a corporation or an LLC. So under those regs at the time prior to 2016, um, if you wanted to register these, there were certain obligations an individual, a natural person would have versus a trust. And that's what gave advent to the trust movement because you could then avoid the sheriff because the trust wasn't required to get the sheriff's permission. And that's what Obama changed. Makes sense. Okay. Well, that gave advent to the NFA trust movement, but uh, you know that is not the only reason to do an NFA trust. So when they changed that in 2016, a lot of gun trust attorneys were thinking, "Oh my gosh, the business is going to fall off the cliff." And I, I saw it coming, and I realized that a lot of people would just instead of hiring an attorney and paying for a trust, just register in their individual name. The problem with that is there's two main benefits to a, an NFA trust, and I say NFA trust to be very, very um, specifically accurate. Um, because I don't want it to be confused with the general gun trust. So an NFA trust, you avoid probate. The last estate I did where I had to put a machine gun through, I think cost somewhere in the neighborhood of five to six grand in legal. I'm just dealing with the ATF's paperwork. I'm also dealing with the court, right? And I might have to find a buyer for the gun, depending on if there's creditors. There's a lot of other things going on, right? So if you do a trust, you avoid probate. It doesn't go into the court system. It literally is handled outside of court in, in almost every jurisdiction that I'm aware of. So it's just uh, not part of the estate. That's, it's not. It's not part of the probatable estate. It's yep. part of the overall estate for tax purposes. But you have different types of estates, right? You have the probatable estate, the taxable estate. These are different things. Sure. Um, so, yes, to answer your question, it's not part of the probatable estate. The second benefit is what I call the multiple user benefit. 
So if Andrew Bronca buys a Tommy gun and he owns it in his individual name, pays the tax, he's going to have a tax return with a stamp on it called a tax stamp. It proves the tax was paid. So when you hear the term tax stamp, it's an actual stamp. Um, as a side note, my first purchase was a suppressor. I actually still have, I actually have a lickable stamp. They were using lickable stamps in 2010, I think was my first purchase. They don't anymore. They're digitally printed. Um, those lickable stamps, if you can get them, I think are, are valuable to stamp collectors. I had heard somewhere they're worth about $200. So I, I don't know if that's true. So just heads up. Um, but nevertheless, um, the other benefit is multiple users. So when you have that stamp, Andrew Bronco's got the Tommy Gun Richards to him. That stamp is in his name only. Only Andrew Bronco can possess the firearm. And you may or may not know from, from law class, Andrew, what the legal definition of possession is, but it is defined, right? It's dominion and control. All right. And then you have something called constructive possession. You know, DEA comes into your house, you're sitting under the table, you have a bunch of crack cocaine on the top of the table. You're not physically touching it, but you're in constructive possession of it. It's the power and intent to exercise dominion and control. Um, so with a trust, who, who is the gun register to? Well, it's the trust. And how does the trust manifest ownership? Through its trustee, right? And a trust in most states can have as many trustees as it, it wants. So in a trust, you can have multiple people on as trustees that can literally possess this gun completely legally. Whereas if you're an individual, you have to be very, very careful on when you're surrendering dominion and control of that firearm. Does that answer your question in a long way? <clears throat> so um, I can have dominion and control of that firearm. It's all appropriately registered in my name, but my buddy wants to borrow it to go shoot it at the range by himself. Can't that do it unless he's on the trust. Yeah, okay. Can't do so it that's what the trust allows you to do in part is put other people into an ownership position so they can lawfully possess the firearm. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, not individually owner, but as a trustee exercising right. their ownership rights. Okay. If that makes sense. Sure. So, uh, yeah, so, you know, if, uh, if I had family members or friends or whatever that I wanted to be able to make use of my hypothetical machine guns or suppressors or stuff like that, it would, if I own those individually, I, would I have to accompany them to the range to use those yes. things? Yeah, the way you think about it this way, you, you're aware of Knob Creek Machine Gun Shootout, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can rent these guns there and ATF's not arresting people for it. But the general theory is, is as long as you're there and you can get, uh, you can acquire the firearm readily. I think you're you're in a good position to argue you're maintaining dominion and control. I know of no cases where somebody's standing next to the person and, and they've argued they don't have dominion and control. It doesn't mean that case would never come. So we're very cautious and conservative when we tell clients about these things. Sometimes um, spouses don't want anything to do with guns, but they're living with someone who wants an NFA gun. And if they have access to those guns, then theoretically, while they're in the house, they could be, it could be argued that they're in constructive possession of the gun. Sure. So we may want to put the spouse on the trust as well. Right. That makes sense. And that could be argued even if the husband's just out running an errand out of the house, right? Just argued, absolutely. And, and yeah. we should probably clarify for your audience um, what the law actually covers. Um, it's not just machine guns, but it's also suppressors or what the ATF uh, terms silencers. It's um, short build rifles, short build shotguns, and there's a catch all called AOW, any other weapon. When the law was first proposed, it regulated all guns until the NRA got involved at the 11th hour and carved out an exception for handguns and some other things. But it was going to regulate most guns. Now, this law was necessitated not only for Al Capone, a little bit more history. A lot of people don't know there was an attempted assassination on FDR's life in which um, the actual person that died was the mayor of Chicago. I can't remember his name, Cernak, I think. And the gentleman who killed him was a communist and death row is named after him. He was, he, he killed the mayor, was tried and convicted and, and, and put to death within, I think, something like 33 days. All very, very quickly happened. And because in the Miami County Jail where he was held, um, the death, uh, the death cell, as they called it, it, was already taken. So they actually put him in with like the, the death chair and that they termed death row. And that's where that name comes from. Hmm. Okay. So I guess one way to, to do this kind of thing with a, with a trust is someone's planning to, they'd like to buy a short barreled rifle or a suppressor or a fully automatic weapon of some kind. Uh, and they say, you know, what? before I actually do that purchase, acquire possession, uh, I'm going to set up a trust beforehand. So, and I want to circle back to that. But before I do that, 
What about people who may have already purchased an NFA item? Uh, they don't, they purchased it prior to having any kind of trust. And now they're thinking to themselves, hmm, you know, I hadn't thought about it before, but now I'm hearing uh, this uh, Law of Self-Defense show with Derek DeBras, and maybe I should set up a trust after the fact uh, to um, to include or encompass these items. Yeah, so that can be done. You have to pay $200 to get it into the trust. So every time the gun transfers ownership or title, if you will, you get, that's when the tax is invoked. And, and that form to the ATF is, in fact, a tax return. This law was deemed unconstitutional in a case, I think it was the client's name was Haynes, H-A-Y-N-E-S. And I can't remember what year. I think it was like 38, 1938. And um, the reason it was unconstitutional, say in the, the county that Chicago sits in, I think it's Cook County, it's illegal to have a machine gun. Well, Derek DeBras is there and the NFA just came out. So he registers it. So he's legal under federal law, but still committing a state crime. The sheriff calls the ATF NFA division and says, I have suspicion that Derek owns a machine gun. Tell me if he's on the registry. They tell him. They come out and arrest me. There's a Fifth Amendment violation. So they gutted the NFA back then, but then they went back to the drawing board and said, look, this is a confidential tax return. This cannot be used against anybody for criminal purposes unless you uh, forge or do some sort of fraud on the actual document itself, much like our personal returns. It is a tax return. You are, in fact, paying a tax. Okay, so you when you purchase the items, the NFA items, you paid two hundred dollars to for that transfer, and then if you want to put them in a trust later, you pay another two hundred dollars per item to That's get right. them into the trust. And is there a document uh, that like says the trust has these items and they're all serialized and there's a list? So, um, so most trusts, depending on how it's drafted, there will be either a schedule of assignments or an Exhibit A, and that those released privately will be your list of or your inventory of firearms from the ATS position. You have to file what's known as either a form one or a form four. A form one is if you're making the gun yourself, you can make guns in the United States. I can make my own suppressor. The diversified machine fiasco is a good example of that. So you can make your own suppressor and register it to the registry, cut a barrel, make an SBR. You can't make a new machine gun. Not allowed to do that. Um, so, so with regards uh, to the forms, that's what the form one does. The form four means the gun's already on the registry and you're just transferring it from owner to owner. So those forms, when they're submitted to the ETF, are submitted in duplicate and they send one back with a stamp on it saying that it's been approved. Okay. And you would presumably keep that with your trust documents. Y yeah, that's where I keep mine. And I take a, I take a photo of it with my phone. Uh, the law says that upon, um, upon request, uh, from the IRS, you have to prove that you paid the tax. The ATF does not have the right to see the gun. They don't have the right to come into your house. You don't waive your your constitutional rights against unlawful search and seizure because you have one of these guns. People get confused about that. They think, oh, I, I have a tax stamp. I've waived that right. No, they're confusing it with people who have who have kitchen table FFLs for the purposes of building new machine guns, which a lot of people do. And so those people, though, because their their home now is a business premise, it's subject to inspection by the ATF at least once every 12 months. So with that said, the people are, are conflating the two. So if you own these guns and have a tax stamp, they don't have a right to come in your house. They don't have a right to see the gun. They can only demand that you show them proof you paid the tax. Okay. So if someone's thinking about setting up uh, an NFA trust in particular, um, I know every once in a while I go into uh, my local gun store and they'll have pamphlets on the counter, get your NFA trust for $24.99 or, or whatever yeah. uh, the deal is that they're offering. Is that something people should be wary of? Absolutely. Um, and it's not just in gun law. I mean, trust mills, as we call them in estate planning, have been rampant over the years. There was a case right before I became a lawyer of an insurance company that was selling uh, trust to uh, blue hair ladies in nursing homes. They were practicing law without a license and they got popped for it for millions of dollars. So there is some risk. In addition to that, you're not getting any legal advice. And that could be problematic. It could affect your overall estate, you know, theoretically, depending on, on what you're doing. This is a sophisticated um, estate planning tool uh, that should be done by competent counsel. I've seen the craziest one I saw was a trust. It was one of those cheaper trusts was brought into my office. And um, the client had made, this is going to sound weird, but the client had made the trust, the grant tour of the trust. Hmm. The trust gave birth to itself. It's not possible. So the trust doesn't exist, but the ATF had allowed these guns to be registered to this trust because they didn't read it closely. Trust wasn't valid, you know, 
Um, or you have the doctrine of merger where people make themselves the end all be all of the trust. There is no other party. So there is no separation of title. So the trust doesn't exist. So there's all these issues that can come up. When you get an attorney, you can always call them. I review the first transfer paperwork free of charge to make sure it's right. So the client understands how the process works. There's just a lot more to it. And you get a lot more service when you use a, a competent attorney to do it. So the point you just mentioned that someone would make themselves the end all and be all of the trust. Does that mean a trust has to involve multiple people? It has to involve a definite beneficiary that cannot solely be the grantor. So the doctrine of merger holds is that if there is a separation of title, it can merge back together and there is no trust. Remember what a trust is, is that separation of title. Right. So if I uninformed as not a lawyer go to, you know, uh, Acme gun range and they have a stack of gun trust there in the corner. I fill it out. I make myself the grantor. I make myself the trust only trustee and I make myself the only beneficiary because I don't know any better. There is no trust, right? Because everything is still owned by me. There's still no separation of title. Makes sense. Yeah. Yep. That ha I've seen that happen from time to time. So it's things like that, that people don't understand where they're putting themselves at risk. And if the trust is not drafted correctly, it might not accommodate things like red flag orders or what if the beneficiary is disabled or mentally incompetent? Or what if they want to sell the guns because they don't like guns? How do we handle that? You know, and the trust we've drafted, I, it's come out of my head. It's not a form I've purchased. I, as a gun owner that owns more guns than I should, um, I thought, all right, what do I need in this trust? And I, I use the trust that I sell to my clients. Okay. So if someone doesn't want to take that route um, of just picking up a, a pamphlet or a form and filling it out themselves, probably an error. Uh, what's the proper way to go about doing this? How how would somebody, obviously anybody in Ohio could contact you, sure. uh, Derek DeBras at, how would they do that? Um, yeah, you just go to Munitions Group. It's Derek at Munitions Group. Or they, the best thing for them to do is just call the office or email or general email, which is info at Munitions Group. We'll send you an intake. We'll quote you a fee. And then uh, we usually get that trust done within a week. Um, there's a lot of other competent attorneys out there. David Goldman in Florida, Josh Prince in Pennsylvania are two really reputable people that have done gun trusts over the years that I've worked with. Um, and more and more attorneys are getting involved, but be wary, make sure the gun attorney is an actual gun lawyer, not an attorney who likes guns. I've had, I've actually sat through a CLE. It was a gun trust CLE. I was curious. Attorney got so many things wrong, things that could have put the clients into criminal positions. Um, you know, so it's, it's just making sure you have somebody that knows what they're doing and has done it for a while. Yeah, folks. So I'm an attorney who likes guns and who's very careful not to claim any expertise uh, in gun law. There's a difference between liking something and actually having expertise in the law uh, on that subject. So if people go the right route, go to competent legal counsel, such as yourself or, or Josh who uh, in Pennsylvania, who I also have done quite a bit of work with, uh, another great attorney, uh, what should they expect at the cost to set up one of these trusts the right way? In our office, it'll range depending on what the client wants. If it's a, if it's a basic NFA trust, you're, you're looking somewhere around a thousand dollars for office. It's expensive. We're not cheap. I, I fully admit that, but we give the client the service that they expect. Um, I've seen it range. I think the general price, the market average is probably five to $800 in that neighborhood. So we're on the higher end of that, but I've seen these things go much, much higher than that. I mean, my prices range uh, just depending on what the client needs and wants, you know, it could be anywhere from, thousand dollars to five thousand dollars right i've done a gun trust for ten thousand dollars but it was a very specific type of asset protection trust it was a very sophisticated trust that invoked a very specific state law and asset protection so i would tell the clients that they should expect anywhere from five hundred dollars and up okay and that might be for a client who's not looking for something super sophisticated right. but wants to get some nfa items right. perhaps and you know right. get that, that around five hundred to a thousand dollars is my guess yeah okay uh, let me scroll through the comments here and see if we have any uh, productive questions. Folks, if, if you want to guarantee your question is going to be answered, then I would encourage you, as we always do, to have you submit it as a super chat. Uh, we'll promise to answer those. Uh, and it helps us distinguish them from kind of the, the background noise uh, that often exists in these. Uh, yeah, and Derek, you can, uh, if you want to put your name and uh, email address right there in the comments so people can catch that that would be helpful how do i make a comment oh i don't know if you can actually uh, here let me do it on my end um when i'm a guest on someone else's show this way i usually open up the show right in uh, youtube 
uh, and then I'm able to make a comment, but I'll type it in here. So the email is? Info at munitions group would be the best. Info at munitionsgroup.com. That'll go to my uh, paralegal and, and she, we have a pretty good process down to get these done efficiently. Okay, awesome. So let's see. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm just going to look for any super chats that might be here. There may not be any. It's too hard to read through uh, several hundred uh, comments, folks, to look for questions that aren't that aren't highlighted as super chat. So uh, that'll be difficult to do. Uh, but I have put uh, Derek's email address here in the comments, Derek DeBras at info at munitionsgroup.com. And as I said at the start, for anyone who might not have been here at the start, uh, I've worked with Derek myself. I know him personally as an attorney. He uh, does a great job, well worth calling. He's not just somebody I selected randomly uh, to be a guest in this show. So you should have confidence in uh, seeking his services if you're looking for uh, NFA trust, gun trust, any other kind of uh, gun law related matter. So is there anything I should have uh, touched upon that I didn't, Derek? In this? Oh, so let's just, let me rack my brain on some of the things I ran into. So one question is, is multiple users. Um, we've talked about that. Um, we talked about the cost. Um, and we, each of those uh, multiple yeah. users would need to now be fingerprinted and photographed yeah, so the Indeed. trustees get fingerprinted in a photograph. So let's talk about the process, right? Okay. Now, I'm going to talk about it from the standpoint of paper filings. I'm old-fashioned. There's some new that they're they're starting to roll out. I I don't think they have yet, but ATF e forms is supposed to have a form four version here soon if they haven't already. It used to be you can only do form ones that you're making the gun, and it's substantially faster historically if you do it through the e filing. So the average wait time on paper, I think, is anywhere from eight months to 12 months. The longest I've ever waited is 14 months um, to get approved. So you And that's that's to get ATF permission to actually acquire possession of the that's item. That's right. right. So some right. ranges, if you buy a suppressor at like Blackwing Shooting Center in Delaware, Ohio, um, they'll let you use it if you go to the range there during that wait time. So that's kind of a nice thing at most ranges that they'll do. Um, but what you'll normally do is you'll, you'll submit a copy of the trust. Never, ever, ever give the original trust to the ATF. You will not get it back. Okay. I had a client once submit the original of the ATF. Didn't make a copy of it before he sent it. Called me and I said, well, uh, I can do a restatement of trust, but we don't have the original terms. We can use mine, but it's going to cost you, you know, a lot of money to do that. <laughs> Should have kept it. Um, so don't send them a copy, but or, uh, the original, send them a copy. Um, if there's any attachments or amendments or schedules or exhibits they need, that needs to be attached with it, every trustee must fill out a form. I think it's a form 20, if I remember correctly, or 23. Um, it's the trustee background check form. Uh, you'll do a form four or form one with that. And then because there's multiple trustees, that's why we go to the form 20s. And that all gets submitted to the ATF with a uh, payment of $200 can be put on a credit card. And then, like I said, about eight to 12 months later, the stamp will be sent to the person selling the transfer or right. And they'll call you up, say, hey, your gun's here. Come get it. If it's from a dealer, you will have to run a background check on your 4473. This is important. And I'll give you a quick story about this. It'll ask, are you the actual transferee? You answer yes, even though it's the trust. If you look at the instructions on the 4473, it tells you that. Now, what you're supposed to do or the dealer's supposed to have you do is sign an affidavit or a sworn statement, I think is what they call it, saying that you're doing this on behalf of that entity. So like for a company to buy a gun, right? Right. Um, I had a client, I, I generally advise my clients to get a, a bank account for the trust so that you run all the money through that account. So it's clear the trust is doing the purchasing. And I had a client go to, I want to say it was PNC at the time. This is years and years ago. Um, and um, they, they gave him the account. Two weeks later, they shut it down and said, we can't be affiliated with criminal activity. And I said, what do you mean? Or say, well, he's answering these 4473s that he's the actual transfer or and he's not. I said, you idiots, read the instructions. How many times do you think companies buy guns? Do you think these people are all committing felonies? It's crazy. Um, and so I don't recommend people use, or no, it's Key Bank. It was Key Bank. So I don't recommend people use Key Bank anymore for this. Um, but so that's just uh, some other points that came to mind. So, uh as an individual, if I want to buy a suppressor, I go through that process with the ATF and it may take whatever, nine months, 10 months, 12 months, who knows, it's up to them, I guess. 
uh, before I'm, uh, they tell me that I'm, I'm privileged to legally possess that item finally. What about when you add a trustee to the trust? Is, does it take a, is it like that period of time for each individual to be approved for possession no. or is no. the background check more like the background check you'd go through just to buy a regular firearm? So no. Um, so if, if I form a trust today and I buy 10 items tomorrow and six weeks from now, I want to put you on the trust. It's a simple amendment. It takes 30 seconds, right? Okay. Call the attorney. We charge, I think, anywhere from 100 to $300 to do an amendment, depending on the complexity. And then I'll email it to you. You'll sign it, send it back to me. It doesn't even have to go to the ATF. But on the next purchase, that's when you would have to get photographed and fingerprinted. It's on the purchase, right? It's oh, I see. Now, now, here's what you don't want to do. Some people do do this. Um, all right, I add you because you want to use the guns, and now I'm ready to buy a new one. And you're like, no way in hell am I getting fingerprinted. So I mend the trust again. I remove you. I buy the new one. As soon as I submit it, I go out, add you back with a third amendment. So, right, it's arguable that what you're doing is committing a fraud on the government, right? So you're you're playing sure. with the, the laws. You're playing, you're playing fast and loose. It's very dangerous. It's a felony. So I do not recommend clients do that at all. Uh, but I do know that some people do do that. Okay. All right. We did have one super chat question come up that I can find. And it says... Uh, uh, other Murr, thank you very much for your super chat. And the question is, is it better to have separate trusts for different NFA and non NFA guns? So tradition, historically, when I started, I, for about a year combined the two, but I gave it further analysis and thought. And I, since then, this is years ago, I started separating them out and we do like a buy one, get one free deal. So you're not overpaying if you get both of them. Uh, the reason being is technically speaking, when you submit an application to the ATF, you have to give them a copy of the trust in all accompanying documents. That could be any schedules or exhibits. So if you have a schedule listing all your, your regular everyday average guns, you sort of created a de facto registry with the ATF by giving them that information. Um, so we do separate those out also for liability reasons. If someone gets hurt with one of the guns, it makes it a little bit more separate and harder to um, access certain pieces of property. And Andrew, there is one thing I wanted to mention on a constitutional matter regarding this, but I'll, I'll wait till the appropriate time. No, go ahead. Now's a good time. We're working on a case right now. This doesn't have to do directly with trust, but it has to do with the NFA. And, it, it, you know, I remember in 2008 when the Heller case came out, and I read Scalia's opinion, and I pointed to a clause he put in there, and I can't recite it verbatim, but it said something like, um, this doesn't mean that longstanding prohibitions on novelty guns like mm -hmm. guns sure. are invalid. Well, I always hated that clause, one, because they're only longstanding because no one's ever freaking challenged them, right? right. It, it, was, it was kind of a circular argument. And um, there is no case law, and in fact, there's case law that indicates the opposite, that NFA guns are protected by the Second Amendment. Um, we're having people get even denied guns because, as you know, the background check, check system is a horrible system. And we're challenging these things in court. I haven't gotten that far in litigation yet, but it makes me wonder you know, if I'm going to be successful, if it's not protected by the second amendment, the government can just say, we're not going to approve it because the background check is all a mess. But then where does that leave the client? Right. It's kind of crazy when you think about it. So we are working on that issue on a constitutional standpoint. It's, it's tricky. So what happens if someone goes to a local gun store, says, I want to buy a suppressor and they're doing it all the right way. Uh, Presumably they pay the gun store, whatever it is, the 600 or 800 bucks or a thousand bucks for a suppressor. Uh, and then it has to go through this six months, nine month, 10 month process with the ATF. And the ATF comes back and says, no, you can't have it. So they'll usually call me. You'll want to get a hold of counsel because we have to figure out why. Right. And if we can fix it quickly, we will. So our office will work with the background check and we're doing one right now. It's based out of Illinois, which is a nightmare. And we try to fix it through the state level, but we came to the conclusion we couldn't. All right. And here's where it gets real interesting. If you went to the gun store and bought a regular Glock, right? A Title I firearm, non-NFA. NFA is Title II firearms. Regular guns are Title I. So you buy a regular gun, you do a 4473, you get denied. You have a statutory right to file an action in federal court and the burdens on the government. Clear as day, but not with NFA, right? There is no statutory action. So it's got to be based on Second Amendment grounds when you litigate this. So what the AUSAs will do, and that means assistant U.S. attorneys, the federal prosecutors, I've never had them not do this. They will try to fix it for you. Like right? they'll, they'll call the local jurisdiction and try to find the records. But the one I'm dealing with now, they have this notation that says undisposed for a juvenile felony. 
but he had it expunged. And the AUSA says, I just got to get my hands on the signed entry expunging this. I'm like, come on, man. Do you think it exists? They've expunged it. The file has gone. You know, so we're in this position where I don't think we're going to get it resolved. And we're going to have to argue that the NFA is protected by the Second Amendment, I think, you know, because we don't have a statutory right to attack it. The NFA item. NFA items generally. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Ninth Circuit has some case law on this that they're not protected. They, of course, cited to the Scalia comment. I knew that was going to be a problem. I was so mad at him when he put it in there. But I think he was forced to by some of his liberal uh, colleagues on the bench. You would think so, right? Because, I mean, of course, the big fear from the liberals, states like New York or Massachusetts, would be that effectively all their gun control laws would go clear out the window. Yeah. Uh, if you didn't yeah. include some kind of open-ended language like that. But it, it begs the question, <clears throat> in like my client's case... Which, by the way, that should. All those gun control laws should go clear out the window. I disagree. Uh, in my opinion, but no one's put me in charge yet. So. It, it does beg the question, like in my client's case, if the Second Amendment doesn't protect the NFA, then what's he to do? Just not, he's not allowed to have the gun? Just that's it. You know, Andrew Bronca standing right next to my client can go out and buy the same gun, but this guy can't. He's not allowed. That doesn't. That's not fair. That's not just. So we're crafting arguments to try and deal with that. All right. Interesting. Well, keep me apprised of that. I'd be. Uh, I don't yeah. do a lot of gun law stuff, but I am a gun owner. I'm a consider myself a Second Amendment absolutist, and uh, I'd be interested in uh, hearing anything about uh, the gun laws becoming, well, what the second amendment says they should be. Sure. Yeah. Not a problem. So here's another question from fair frozen 55. Uh, we got a couple, couple super chat questions coming in, but fair frozen asks, have you ever dealt with guns? People made themselves and added to a trust asking for a friend who wants to 3d print his own guns. Yeah, it can be done. Um, you know, you're allowed to make your own guns as long as it's legal in the state you're in. Of course, it's not a registered item. If it's not NFA. Um, then you just probably you're going to have to get into the trust somehow. You have to identify it, right? At least in my state of Ohio, it's just identifying it. So you want to put some sort of identifying markings on it so that you can identify it on an exhibit A or a schedule. If you don't like like, like a serial number, yeah, that's thing. the best thing to do because otherwise you would have to say. All my 3D printed guns found in my Liberty safe in my office at this address. And, and what if it's not there? You know, it's just a matter of identifying the item. Putting property into the trust in most states is extremely easy. It's simply putting it on a schedule. Okay. Another question here from Steve. Uh, it says, my son lives in Seattle and I live in Ohio. Does he have to physically come to Ohio to become a trustee under the trust? Or can he do everything where he is in Seattle? Ohio wouldn't have a problem with him being a trustee. I can't speak to Oregon law or Washington law. I said Oregon. Um, but yeah, Ohio wouldn't have a problem with it. If the trust is based out of Ohio, it has a nexus to Ohio. Um, the grantor is in Ohio, but you want to add your son in Seattle as a trustee. That's perfectly legal to do. Um, that trustee will exercise rights over the property as needed when he can. There's no problem with that. In fact, if he is a trustee, you can even register some of these guns to that address as well. A trust can have multiple addresses. Right. So you could you could register that a gun to your son in Washington state and have one registered to your house in Ohio. That is possible. So I've heard I don't know if this is true, but I've heard that if you own an NFA item like a, a machine gun or a short barreled rifle or a suppressor in a particular state. And believe it or not, I lived in Massachusetts for 25 years and there was uh, plenty of people owning NFA items in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. We had a machine gun range at my local club. Um, but of course, Massachusetts is a small state. You go 30 minutes in any direction and you're in New Hampshire or Vermont or some other place um, where it's also lawful to have a machine gun. But I had heard that if you have your NFA item in your state where you're allowed to have it and you want to bring it across the state border, you have to get permission by the ATF before you can bring it across the state border. That's correct. Other than with suppressors. Okay. Um, there was a 2011 reg change, I think, on suppressors, but I always tell clients to double check in case they change it again. Yeah, I think that's actually the Form 20. Um, you fill that out, send it in the ATF, they approve it. You can get up to one year permission at a time, and you can go back and forth from that same location for up to 12 months at a time. Um, and then, of course, the Gun Owners Protection Act, safe passage law comes into play. You know, the end destination has to be legal. The beginning destination has to be legal, making reasonable stops along the way. Okay. But if you had it in a trust, say you had, you lived in Massachusetts, but you had a vacation home in New Hampshire, you could put both addresses on the trust and then you wouldn't have to do that ATF notification. So what I, so what, what you could do, um, it's only, you only have one address 
uh, on the form four. That's where it's registered. That's where it's going to be principally maintained. Okay. So you could re, um, how would, you could update the records by telling ATF you're moving to the New Hampshire address, and that's where you want it registered now. Either way, you're going to have to contact ATF though. So you Got might it. as well default the form twenty. So you can go back and forth, you know, but you're going to have to get permission to transfer it to a new address. Okay. Let's see. Uh, another question here um, from Roy asks, if your spouse is a prohibited possessor, can you keep NFA items in your home? I guess this would also apply to regular guns. It, it, that's just a firearms question. Yeah. There's a case out of Pennsylvania that came out about five or six years ago, Andrew. And I, I can't remember it, but it kind of dealt with this. There was a, a felon, the girlfriend was with him. They charged her for, um, you know, aiding and abetting a felon in possession of guns, but they were her guns. Um, and, and here's the advice I generally give. As long as the government cannot prove that you aided and abetting somebody in possessing, this comes back to the definition of possession, right? And, and possessing those guns. So at a minimum, if you're going to keep guns in the house, you need to have them in a safe where only you have access to them. And the government can't prove that your wife would have access to them. Because remember, they would have to prove constructive possession in that instance. So they have to prove right. that she had the power to possess the guns. She had the intent to possess the guns. And she had um, dominion and control derived there from. And of course, it's a problem for both people, right? So the prohibited person could be charged as having right. constructive possession of the firearm. And then the other party could be charged with right. aiding and abetting that unlawful possession. There is no statute to get to your list, to get to your, uh, your listeners uh, point um, that says, if you are married to a felon, you can't own guns. It just doesn't exist. It's unconstitutional to say that. So yes, you can still exercise your constitutional rights. You just have to understand the parameters of the criminal code. Okay, a question here from Pink Sniper. Uh, should a Gatling gun be put in an NFA trust or a regular gun trust? I guess, they're, they're, really, they're asking, is it an NFA item, I guess? Yeah, I'd have to know the make, model, how it functions. Uh, you know, a machine gun's defined as basically any weapon. I'm going to cut out a bunch of the nonsense, but basically any weapon that can fire uh, multiple rounds from a single function of the trigger. Um, I don't know if ATF considers a traditional Gatling gun NFA. I have one of those Ruger uh, Gatling guns. You, got, you may have seen them. They take uh, Ruger 1022s. They put two of them into this contraption and then you spin it. Oh, but I it see. It's got this thing that's pulling the trigger very quickly. So there's always right. a single, it's just happening in, in unison. Um, so it depends on what gun specifically they're talking about. But from an estate planning standpoint, it also depends on how valuable the gun is. You know, from, you know, do we need to get this out of probate for whatever reason? Um, so there's a lot more variables that I would need to know to answer that question directly, but potentially, potentially. As a general rule, would it be true to say you you generally want to keep as much property out of probate as possible? Yeah, that, that's that's generally the estate planning theory is that in you know, Ohio is a really good state for that because you don't need to do a trust to keep most things out of probate. There's a lot of transfer and death falls we have. So you can put a TUD on your house, on your car, things like that, um, because it keeps the cost down. The theory is if you go to court, you got to pay court costs and attorney's fees. If you keep everything out of court, it happens instantly. Uh, it makes it harder for creditors to access the property, and it makes it a much more efficient and seamless transition after death. So for people who have a, a, a sizable, or maybe even not a very sizable, but perhaps a valuable uh, collection of guns, uh, some guns are extremely valuable. You have a half dozen of them. Suddenly you're talking about a lot of money. Right. Uh, it can be well worth it to have a, uh, not necessarily an N NFA trust, but a gun trust just for that purpose, to keep that property out of probate. We did one for a very wealthy client who has millions of dollars in machine guns. We just put his machine guns in that trust and is an asset protection trust. So you have a lot of stuff. People want your stuff. They're going to sue you. So we carved out that part of his estate and put it into an asset protection trust. So if he got sued, his creditors couldn't touch him. So it protects those assets. Couldn't touch the property within that trust. Within that trust. But you, yeah. most asset protection trust laws, you can't put everything you own into the trust. Sure. That's straight up avoidance of creditors, which is generally a crime. Um, but you can carve out certain segments of your estate and put it in an asset protection trust. Okay. All right. Well, almost an hour, Derek. Okay. And uh, well. appreciate all your time. I think we hit all the, uh, the key points or at least the, all the uh, super chat questions. Uh, again, if folks want to know more, you can contact Derek's office at info at munitionsgroup.com. Did I get that right? Yep, that's right. And uh, certainly he can help you in uh, in Ohio, you, also in the other states in which you're licensed, Derek? Yeah, our office is licensed in Georgia, Kentucky, and Ohio, and we have of counsel in Florida, D.C., 
Uh, there's a couple other states and we have contacts in all 50 states. We can definitely help. Just give us a call. So a good place to start for anyone who's interested right, in either right. a, a gun trust generally or an NFA trust in particular. And uh, again, I know Derek personally, he does great work, great attorney. So uh, uh, you shouldn't have any hesitancy uh, reaching out there. I would certainly do that before I'd pick up some kind of pamphlet in your local, you know, 1200 square foot gun shop <laughs> uh, and start dealing with somebody, uh, send credit card numbers to people you don't know. <laughs> All right, folks, Derek, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. The very first plank owner, plank owner guest on the Law of Self-Defense Show. Uh, we much appreciate your time and uh, and uh, best wishes to you and your family out there on that farm you live on with all the all the cows and pigs and chickens. And stuff. <laughs> we don't have any livestock, not yet. Okay. <laughs> all right, guys, remember, uh, if you carry a gun, so you're hard to kill. That's why I carry a gun. That's why... Presumably Derek carries a gun. We want to be hard to kill. We want our families to be hard to kill. Then you also owe it to yourself and your family to make sure you know the law, gun law too, uh, to make sure you're hard to convict. And with that, I'll see you all next time. Take care, Derek. Thanks a lot, buddy.